I'm Donald Paul. Uh, I'm director of the Energy Institute at the University of Southern California and a faculty member in the School of Engineering. If you look at the, the total energy mix, and, and it tends to get lost in, in, in a lot of energy conferences, people think it's electricity. It's very important, but it's not all there is by any means. The other is transportation fuels, which is another major uh, source of energy. But um, one of the items that came up today that I thought was, was interesting and in the context of the opening remarks was talked about a potential thousand X expansion in the use of, uh, of digital information and a corresponding growth of some size in the energy to mobilize those digits, either personally or in data centers or through the trans telecom system. Uh, one of the things that came up is that in the advanced economies, uh, like the United States and Europe, basically energy demand has been flat. Okay, it's not growing, yet obviously the amount of energy we're consuming for digits continues to grow. So uh, an obvious conclusion is we're consuming, we're moving energy demand from somewhere else. Uh, and that comes out of the efficiency gains we're gaining in a number of sectors. So the basic principle here is that as we strive for greater energy efficiency, history shows that we tend to consume the efficiency gains by doing more things, or building more things, or having more things, or driving more, whatever it is, we gain efficiency, then we consume it. And this has an implication here because were the digital demand to grow, as was suggested by some, in inordinately grow, and you were not able to make up in energy efficiency gains per byte, are we actually at a hiatus instead of a flat point potentially tending downward, which some people think, but this is actually energy demand will begin to grow. And I think it has tremendous implications because many people are thinking that energy efficiency will continue to get built into the system uh, and certainly uh, it's an important aspect of meeting many views about sustainability and uh, emissions reduction and everything else, but what if you start consuming that efficiency? And I think that that has implications. So that was one of the items that we, we talked about. Energy policy in the United States is, is in some ways unique. Uh, and it's unique for a couple of reasons. One, uh, the political structure in the United States in which this, it's a federation in a way. The relationship between the states have are sovereign entities with certain powers under the U.S. Constitution. So the states have some autonomy to push back against demands of the federal government. So uh, that's one thing. The second thing is the states uh, have basically been the managers of energies, uh, both power, oil and gas, natural resources, have basically been uh, the primary driver of those policies for a long, long time, I mean centuries. Uh, the second that's important about the United States, which distinguishes it, and that is virtually all the energy assets are privately owned. Mm -hmm. So this creates, I think, a different combination of dynamics than you see uh, many, many places. Uh, and in fact, uh, I know in, uh, in some areas, the U.S. is absolutely unique in that individuals can own natural resources. That's not true in most countries. Most countries' natural resources are owned by the governments. So, if there was so all of these things, I think, play into a more dynamic, which I think you're seeing in the United States, that a combination of that plus a combination of, of the world's largest and most diverse energy system, we have some of everything, nuclear, oil, gas, coal, renewables of all shapes and sizes, uh, leads to a set of dynamics and then the private enterprise aspect leads to the creation, as we saw at this conference, of all kinds of companies weren't here five years ago. If, if there is perceived a gap in federal uh, regulation, the states step in. In fact, the big challenge in many aspects of the U.S. energy system is overlapping and conflicting regulations between the federal government and the states. And then you end up with a situation where the energy uh, developers are caught in the middle of trying to get navigate their way between the states, the municipalities, the federal government, and all of that. 
but I think it creates a dynamic which in a time of change combined with the extraordinary uh, uh, creative capabilities of the US digital system I think you put all those together and you have a very interesting time with lots of lots of challenges but lots of uh, opportunity one of the challenges I mentioned that did, we didn't talk about really very much, though, is as you expand the digital universe, you add more sensors, you add more controls, more, more devices of all shapes and sizes, you create a corresponding expansion in the cybersecurity exposures. And that's an issue um, that I believe is beginning to come home and, and actually uh, potentially could be a really s disruptive situation because as you connect the digital system to the physicality of things like energy, which are physical things, not just uh, virtual things, you create the opportunity for cyber physical events in which cyber-induced events create really bad physical outcomes. Taking down a grid, overpressioning and exploding a pipeline, there's a whole raft of things that could be as, as cyber attacks move into the automation and control systems that run all of this digital infrastructure. I mean, the people that run power plants or energy infrastructure and the people that run IT centers are not drawn from the same pool. Mm -hmm. These are people who have self-selected their interests and their backgrounds or academic training, and certainly their experiences are very different. So uh, this is this, the, what's called in the, uh, in the industry parlance, the operations tech, information tech, so OTIT boundary. The OTIT boundary is prevalent uh, broadly, it's prevalent inside of companies. It was a ch it was a cultural challenge uh, in in inside of uh, Chevron, because people who run operations and people who work in IT are not the same, don't have the same view of the world. People who run operations, we did have some discussion about this. If you're running a power plant, your focus on reliability and safety is absolutely at the top. Everything else is completely secondary, right? Because if you go down, bad news for a utility. If, worse yet, if you have an event and someone's killed, it's a total disaster, okay? Those are both realities that an operator has to manage. That's not necessarily reliability and certainly being, being uh, uh, having the center running at full performance is, is certainly highly valued for a data center for sure. But it's unlikely somebody's going to get killed if there's an incident. It's, it's uh, the level of reliability required uh, is, is maybe higher because you don't have, in a sense, uh, information systems can have a, enough built-in redundancy that they can manage their way around it. May or may not be true in a power system.